Hi everyone, this is our channel, Meet the Real Story. Please like, share and subscribe. I adore my family. I adore our get-togethers, our joking around, our meals, everything. I can't imagine my life without them. But one day, I almost killed them all. No, I'm not insane, I assure you. So don't worry, I'll tell you what happened. My name is Ginger. I'm 18 years old. As you can see, I'm wearing an apron. This is because I love to cook. I like all things kitchen-related. My happiest moments are when I see my family eating a meal together. I always cook for them. They enjoy it too. And they support me. They let me try different dishes from different countries. I like to listen to their opinions about my cooking skills. I'm also addicted to cooking programs. One day, my cousin Charlotte came to visit before Thanksgiving Day. She likes to dress all in black. And today was no exception. For some reason, she had called me earlier and asked me if I had ever heard of the Thanksgiving Day curse. I said no, of course. So she told me that the curse applied to large families who ate a big meal together on Thanksgiving. The curse was the result of an evil spirit named Vicky who would possess the cook's body in some family's household and poison the whole family. She said that Vicky used to be a housewife who was a great cook and who loved her family. And yet she poisoned them all during Thanksgiving meal. She watched them die one by one, and then she killed herself as the grand finale. At first, I thought Charlotte was joking and trying to scare me, and I told her that it was nonsense, just an old wife's tale. But she said that every legend was usually based on facts. I paused for a second. That was partly true. I went to my room and searched the internet, and found the same information about the curse that she had relayed to me, which frightened me even more. Vicky was just like me. Or was it the opposite? I stopped myself from getting deeper into this. I needed to focus on preparing the meal. On Thanksgiving Day, my father bought some groceries, which included a white bottle of liquid. I presumed it to be milk, though it smelled a little weird. But I thought it was my imagination. My aunt called and said she would be arriving a few minutes later. So I had to hurry and finish the meal quickly. My finishing touch was dessert. It was going to be pumpkin candy. I prepared it using the milk that dad bought. After everyone had arrived, I served dinner. We all sat down and prayed before the meal. Then, everyone started eating. Things were going well. Everyone was chatting merrily and complimenting me on the food. I was overjoyed. But somehow, I couldn't shake this feeling that something was wrong. I looked at Charlotte, but she smiled supportively. Suddenly, one by one, the people around the table started clutching their stomachs and groaning in pain. The last thing I remember before I lost consciousness was my brother calling the ambulance. When I woke up later, I was lying in a hospital bed, alongside all my family members, who were also lying in the hospital bed. The doctor came in and reported happily that we would all be fine. Then he looked at me and winked. He also said, Next time, young lady, I suggest not using white paint in your cooking. And that was how I almost killed my loving family. Hi, my name is Esmeralda and I'm 21 years old. In my country, I was a heroine, a patriotic soldier, and a role model for my generation. But every story has a dark side, and the dark side of my story is that I became a traitor to my own country. I have to tell you my story quickly because, well, you'll find out shortly. My spy career began when some terrorists attacked my country. I was assigned to a counter-terrorism battalion, and we were fighting for our lives. Though we were a strong group, the terrorists were suicidal maniacs who had decimated our troops by just charging into our midst and detonating their explosive vests. Only a few of us survived, fighting against overwhelming odds. Then, an opportunity revealed itself. I noticed that the terrorists were hiding behind some large pipes, natural gas pipelines. As a matter of fact, I shot the biggest pipe and killed them all. I became the heroine to a grateful nation, and suddenly, people were naming their children after me. Everyone wished to be like me. Then, one day, I received a phone call from an anonymous caller who threatened to kill my family if I didn't do what he demanded. So, I met with him and his cronies. The moment I saw him, I could see that he meant business. He was a no-nonsense type of individual. Sure enough, he got straight down to business. He wanted me to tell them all our military secrets, weapons, plans, base, and camp locations, everything. 
If I didn't agree, they threatened to kill everyone in my family, starting with my father, who lived in another city. He said he was recording our meeting, said that if I betrayed this group, they would send the recording to my leaders. I submitted to their demands, because I couldn't bear to cause my family harm. I now had to wear two faces, the heroine and the treacherous informer. I was pleasantly surprised to find that they paid me well for the information I was passing them. My own country hadn't paid me a dime for being their national heroine. So, at least I felt valued and appreciated by the other side. The utility of the information I was supplying them became evident as I watched news reports of new successful terrorist attacks on our country, military bases, camps, and armories. Naturally, our top brass knew that there must be a traitor in their midst, but they had no suspects because I was being very careful. Then, one day, as I was meeting with my terrorist contact to pass on some more information, our soldiers burst into the room and took the terrorist into custody. It turns out that my side had suspected me and had followed me there. The officer told me that I was the last person he would have ever suspected of being a traitor. I offered my hands to him to be handcuffed and taken in. I figured at least ten years in prison, but he made no move to handcuff me. Instead, he just looked at one of his lieutenants, who then pulled out his gun, pulled back its slide, and chambered a round. It seemed that my sentence was to be executed. Right here. Right now. Love what you do until you can do what you love. This is a famous quote that inspires people to seek out their dream job. I heard that quote at school before I graduated and entered the working world. What's that, you ask? Was I successful in achieving my dream? Well, I came this close. Let me tell you about it. My name is Max and I'm 19 years old. Poverty and I are intimate friends and constant companions. I live in one of the poorest neighborhoods in my city. Most of the local citizens work at the seaport. The rest of us, we make a living by scavenging through and collecting rubbish. But I wasn't just an ordinary rubbish collector. No, sir, I was a specialist in that field, like my dad before me. Dad taught my brothers and me how to do it expertly. This is how it worked. Factories liked to use recycled materials to reduce the cost of buying new materials. So we would go to the city rubbish pile and separate out materials into different piles, such as plastics, glass bottles, milk cartons, tin cans, and so on. Then we would sell those materials to factories for reuse in making their products. This recycling process saved the factories a ton of money, but unfortunately, that didn't translate into a ton of money for us rubbish collectors. I had a dream one day of opening my own factory and just sitting back and watching the money flow in. When I told Dad that, he told me that good fortune only happens for a select few people. After hearing those words, I went to bed and dreamed about my future factory. Little did I suspect that my dream might actually come true someday. One day after working late collecting rubbish, while on the way home, I suddenly heard voices coming from a large rubbish pile in front of my home. It seemed that people were using that pile as a place of business to sell drugs and booze. An argument was brewing between two groups. Each group were wielding sticks and knives as makeshift weapons. One guy in group A had a gun and shot someone in group B. So someone in group B stabbed gun guy in group A. After that, a full-on fight ensued, with everyone in both groups joining in the fray. Within minutes, I heard approaching police sirens, which caused the fight to break up and both groups to run away, leaving the bleeding gun guy lying on the sidewalk. I tried to help him by staunching his bleeding. As I was doing so, I noticed a lottery ticket beside him with a letter saying that it was the winning ticket for a million dollar payout. I froze. I looked around. No one was watching, so I acted somewhat ignobly. Then I left quickly. If the police were to arrive and find me with the bleeding man, they might think that I had done it. I rushed home and fell into an easy chair, taking a deep breath of relief. While I was telling Dad about what had happened, there was a knock on the door. It was the Group A and B gangs. The spokesperson for the two groups held a knife in my direction and said, Hand over the lottery ticket or die where you stand. Needless to say, I handed it over post haste. But then he said, I'm sorry, you've seen too much. You have to die. I pleaded, but I didn't see anything, I swear. Suddenly, there was a flash from a camera and the whole group of thugs began laughing. You've been pranked, Dad said as he stepped out from the crowd. My brothers were behind him laughing too. You've been pranked, Dad said as he stepped out from the crowd. My brothers were behind him laughing too. While relieved that my imminent death had been postponed, I was deeply saddened that I had lost my million dollar chance to get my dream factory. 
What rubbish.